Cardi. Yes. Right, quick. Crikey, we're greedy, aren't we? 30 people. Poor stuff is trying to get one, and you're just throwing 30 people out there. Being a bit, nobody wants a coach. Nobody wants some leadership people. No? Help me out later. Hey, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, look, today, um, before I crack into this really, really quick, I'll set some ground rules and, and what I want to do. Today's a really open forum. I'm not going to stand up here and talk at you for an hour and a half. That's not how people learn in general, and they shouldn't. It's going to be really, really interactive. I want you to butt in with questions, thoughts. Um, if you disagree with something I've said, I love being challenged. I love understanding why, so please do. Um, we're going to do some... I won't say role play, we're going to do some practice later, so I'm going to give you a really basic framework of how to have certain types of conversations, which I'm going to give you a chance to practice as well, which is going to be really, really fun. If you don't want to do anything, you don't have to as well. If you just want to bask in the glory of whatever other people are doing, that's sweet. That's cool. Any thoughts or questions before, anything you need to do to get present before we crack on? Fantastic. Excellent. So as Hardy said, my name is Phil. Um, I am, yes, I don't even know what my title is. Phil's fine. Um, Phil will do. Before coming into the, lead, uh, into the learning space, I worked in IT recruitment for about 10 years. Um, prior to that, I had a variety of jobs from plumber and truck driver to martial arts instructor to personal trainer, which you can tell I'm not anymore. Um, all sorts of things. Um, but my passion over the last four or five years, both professionally and personally, has been around coaching, mentoring, um, helping understand people, helping them understand one another, and, and really connecting people. An easy way to say it is I help people learn how to talk to each other better. And I love it. Absolutely love it. So, I'm going to start with a little story. When I was a kid, it's me right there, quite cute. Don't know what happened, but I used to be. When I was a child, there were two words that absolutely I had so much fear of. Just two simple words that just made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. That now as an adult, I completely embrace as two of my most powerful tools when having difficult conversations. Any ideas? Chuck them at me. Just go nuts. What, what do you think a word could be? If you Think about when you were a child. What words did you fear? Stop it. Stop it. Yep. No. Anything else? Why? Why? Yep. Yep. Any, any parents out there? Who's got kids? You love it when your kids ask you why multiple times? <laughs> How good's that? Yeah. Fabian, nailed it. Nailed it. No and why? No, you can't have that candy. No, you can't play after school. No, you can't go drive in the car when you're five. We hear no a lot as a kid, and why I talk about this is because we are conditioned from a young age, and we've evolved this way, we've conditioned a young age to fear conflict. No is a rejection word. We hear it, and we instantly think rejection. Why? Well, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, and I asked why a lot, I got the responses, because. Because I said so. Or if I was really persistent, a clip around the back of the ears, which you can't do anymore, but... I got that, and so I avoided these words. But these are the most powerful words. There's a lot of others, but these are the two that I focus on when engaging in difficult conversations. No comes from a place of wisdom, right? Parents? How many parents say no just to, just to annoy your kids or just to be mean? Hopefully none of you. You say no because you know better. You know the candy's bad for their teeth. You know they need sleep so they shouldn't be out you know that they're not big enough at five to drive a car. So it comes from a place of wisdom. But because of that, we fear them. Now, Hardy asked me, when he came and asked me to do a talk around difficult conversations, I thought straight away, how much time have I got? He said, an hour and a half. I was like, well, that's going to be difficult. How do you take a subject as broad as difficult conversations and talk about it in under like eight hours? It's near on impossible. So I'm going to focus on a couple of things. I started thinking about what would get out of value, hence why we have the board, and we're going to address this at some point. But when I really started to think about difficult conversations in the workplace, in, in my personal opinion, difficult conversations don't exist. They're not real. They're not real for me, anyway. And I'm going to show you why I think that. But what it comes down to, think of foundations of things. It's not that we're bad at having difficult conversations. We're getting worse at having conversations in general. Just any standard. Would anybody disagree with that? Some people find it easier to have conversations than others. I like to talk, obviously, so I find it easy. 
but I've learned how to do this. I wasn't born being able to speak the way that I speak. So I've actually stolen a little bit of content from one of my favorite interviewers. Has anybody heard of Celeste Headley? Nobody. Okay, after this, I'm going to send out a link via the website um, or via Meetup for her, her TED Talk. Celeste Headley is an amazing interviewer and conversationalist. And she basically broke down what she thinks, and I've thrown a few of mine in there, of what are the 10 things you can do tomorrow to have better conversations. So I'm just going to run through those really, really quickly. So the first one, my slide works, really, really simple. Be present. Don't go into a meeting room with someone that you're about to have a difficult conversation with and have, I'd see I don't even have it, have your phone on the table. Don't have your laptop open. When you have your phone on the table or your laptop open, the person in the room with you is not the most important thing there. And that sends subliminal messages and there's, there's a lot of research behind digital dementia and, and anxiety and things that when a computer is out, when a laptop is out, you know, your phone dings. It doesn't matter whether you read it or not, you look at it straight away, you're distracted. The person in the room has to be the most important person there. Don't pontificate. I'm doing a little bit of it now actually. Don't preach. Don't be arrogant or pompous with your opinion. If you've got an opinion, that's fine. Everybody has them. Put it forward and let it go. Asking open-ended questions. Throughout this whole talk, I'm going to repeat this over and over and over. My answer to everything is ask more questions. But we'll get more into that. And don't, don't let, if someone's saying yes or no, and I hear this a lot as a mediator, people go, oh, you know, they're really, really closed. They're saying yes and no to everything. Well, that's your fault. You're asking the questions. If you ask them an, a why, a what, a how, it's, it's difficult to answer yes or no to those things. Going with the flow. Has anybody heard the term conversational flow before? I know a couple of you have because I was talking about it before. Conversational flow is a psychological term of having a thought stuck in your head when you're talking with someone. Right? Do you know what I mean by that? Someone's chatting away, telling you about their day, and then you think, oh, yep, I've got something. And you struggle to listen because our brain can't multitask. As many as people tell you you can multitask, it's actually scientifically impossible to multitask. Your brain moves between two things very, very quickly. It cannot do two things at one time. So go with the flow. It takes, some people call it mindfulness now. Acknowledge your thought and let it go. Really listen to the person that you're with. Um, if you don't know, say you don't know. There's nothing worse than someone going, hey, did you know such and such? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I did. Because the conversation goes on a flow or let's take a, a, a more work sort of related example. Oh, you know, are you having trouble with this type of code? Oh, yeah, yeah, I am. If you're not, say you're not. If you don't know something, if someone says, hey, do you know what the new plugins are? Just say no. Experiences aren't equal. Don't equate yours with mine. We do it, right? At the pub, someone's telling a cool story, you're having a beer, and all of a sudden, oh, yeah, that happened to me too. If my house burns down and your house burns down, it's not the same thing. And again, you're not making that person that you're having the conversation with the most important person in the room. And they should be. And they are. If they're not, don't have the conversation. I don't mean to come across as angry. I'm just very passionate about these types of things. Don't repeat. Now, this is situational based. When would be a, when's a bad time to repeat yourself? Anyone? Yeah, absolutely. Especially if there's a differing opinion and you're putting yours forward, if you keep repeating it, the other person is just going, yeah, mate, I, I heard you, I get it, and they can't move the conversation forward. If you're telling a story, repetition is good. If you're trying to get forward a positive point, repetition to, um, what's the word I'm trying to look for? Repetition to acknowledge a good habit um, is, is a good way to repeat. Otherwise, try not to. Staying out of the weeds is really, really important. What I mean by this is the details don't generally matter. When you're having a conversation with someone, it doesn't matter what the temperature was on the day unless you're speaking about meteorology. It doesn't matter, you know, what they had for breakfast. Get to the point of your story. People are there for you. Well, they should be there for you. So it's you that matters. It's not the, the it's tiny little granular details. This next one is probably, is probably, I've got it at nine, but it's probably the most important. It doesn't say it there, but listen. And actually listen. Humans speak, on average, about 225 words per minute. We can listen at 500 words a minute. 
It should be listening almost twice as much or more than twice than you're talking. And I don't mean actively listen. I mean actually listen. Like you, who do those, who's, who, who's been on an active listening course? Anyone? Hands? No, a couple. I see some nodding. Yeah. They teach you how to nod at people and teach you how to paraphrase, repeat what I've said back to me. Yeah, don't do, don't do that. Yeah, exactly. Don't do that. If you're listening, if you're actually listening, there's no reason to do that stuff because you're just going to do it naturally. And if you don't want to listen, don't be in the conversation. And that sounds difficult as well, but I'm going to teach you how to get out of conversations that you don't want to be in. And the last one, which is funny because I'm not doing it now, is just be brief. Especially if you have to deliver a difficult message. Hardy touched on uh, something that comes up a lot in leadership as a difficult conversation. It's remuneration time. You've got to deliver the message that um, Matt over here is not going to get the pay rise that he expected. What happens? What do you start doing? If, I, if you're the leader and you've got to deliver that message, what happens? No ideas? Yeah, you justify it. What else could you do? You start telling yourself stories. Catastrophization happens. Matt's not going to get his pay rise, so he's going to leave. He's going to quit his job. He's going to tell everybody that zero sucks all of a sudden. Now, what's happening there, because I'm not being brief, because I'm not thinking about being brief, I'm blending my purpose and my outcome. And we do that a lot as humans. When you have the ability to completely separate your purpose and your outcome and focus on your purpose, you will have great conversations and they won't be difficult anymore. My purpose is to tell Matt that he's not getting his pay rise and this is why. My outcome that I want is I still want him to be happy, I still want him to stay here, I want him to grow within the organization. That's a different conversation. And it's kind of outside of my control because that's up to him how he reacts. You cannot control how someone reacts. So being brief, focusing on that purpose, getting to your point, moving forward, and then listening what he has to say, you'll have an amazing conversation. Thoughts, questions, or feedback on any of that? Anything you didn't quite understand? Anything you want to challenge? Yeah. It's a very good question. Everybody hear that? How do you get the emotion out of things? Look, there's, there's no easy way. There's lots of training. It's, when you focus on your purpose, there's no emotion attached to that purpose, right? The emotion is attached to the outcome. So all of the emotion is wrapped up in the fact that I want Matt to be happy. I have no control over that, but I want it. I want him to stay here. It's an emotional thing. The per when you focus on the purpose, it's easier because there's, it's not an emotional decision. You haven't made that decision because you don't like Matt. You've made it based on you know, business decisions. It might be a budget thing. It might be a performance thing. There's a reason for it. If you're making that decision based on an emotional decision, it's, you probably shouldn't be in that position as a manager. It does happen every now and then. Probably doesn't answer you. It's, it's, it takes a lot of practice. And we're going to cover some stuff in a minute that can help you with your emotions. And I've used the word catastrophization. I actually don't even know if that's a real word. I've been using it for years. I think I just made it up. But it is the stories that we tell ourselves. They're not real. They're not real until they actually happen. And they may happen. But at the time that we think about it, they're not real. Now, I say it like it's an easy thing. Now, disclaimer, it took me about 20 years of study and thought and practice to get to this point where I don't get emotional in situations. People can pretty much say anything that they want to me. You could stand up here and do an absolute racist rant at me right now and I won't get emotional about it. I'll get to the bottom of why you've said what you've said and I'll hopefully we'll leave holding hands and you won't say racist things anymore, but I won't get emotional about it. I'm sorry, I don't know that that really answered your question, but we will get to it. Any other thoughts? Yeah. What about sort of the natural kind of human tendency to kind of want to plan for different ways that the conversation could go so that you've got sort of something that you kind of need to ask and then deal with that particular outcome? So, you know, you might, be, you might have been anticipating five different ways that that conversation could have gone, but in some ways, by doing that, you've preempted. Everybody hear that? That's a normal thing, right? I think you almost answered your own question, though, which is a very good point. What's the risk of that? What's the risk of preparing for outcomes that haven't eventuated? I think the risk is being unprepared, so you're blindsided by something and you're not sure how to react to it, and so you're not interacting as often as you would otherwise. 
that is a way of looking at it? Absolutely. What if, so, and, and, and I'm generalizing here, but in my experience, when people over prepare, or I, I think you said I overthink these things, that's where the catastrophization comes into. And that's when the biology comes into it. It's not psychology, it's biology. Your amygdala and your hippocampus kick in and you start getting hot and your blood vessels shrink and you start getting sweaty and you start worrying and you struggle to formulate a conversation and all of these things that I've just talked about become difficult because we're thinking about things that we have no control over. How you react, I have no control over whatsoever. And that, again, it's easier said than done and it's years of practice. But when we over-prepare, we're preparing for an outcome. Prepare for your purpose. If you are so prepared for your purpose, then the outcomes will change. They still may go away and it still may eventuate and it does happen. But if, if I'm completely prepared in my purpose, I have to deliver the fact that Matt's not gonna get a pay rise. Sorry, I keep picking on you, Matt. I've got all these questions, because I'm like, okay, my purpose is this, so Matt is likely to ask me why. I can't just say, hey, you're not gonna get a pay rise and then leave. I'm prepared to tell him why. If he doesn't like it, again, it's up to him, but I've followed my process. I have a full, robust understanding of why I've delivered this purpose. It's the same in any situation. And hopefully, you know, it'll get to a point where they won't have any other questions. And if he's still angry, well, he's gonna leave. Oh, he's going to leave the room, and they may come back. And I'm going to teach people how to receive feedback as well in a minute, um, which will answer a couple of those. Anything else? Cool. I'm going to keep moving forward. And this is why this is really, really important. I can't stress listening. Does anybody know who M. Scott Peck is? Great psychologist, very smart man. But true listening requires a setting aside of oneself. When you're having a conversation with someone, it's not about you. It's about them or at least it should be. When delivering feedback, if you're a manager, if you're a people leader, feedback is always, always for the person you're giving it to. It's never for you. And if it is for you, don't give it. Or reframe it. And we're gonna to get to that in a minute as well, because that's one of my favorite things when it comes to feedback. Cool, so this is, this is what I mean. Types of difficult conversations. When Hardy asked me, I was like, well, what, are, what does difficult conversations mean to people? Because, you know, if I see them in the workplace. What, have we got a couple up here? Anybody want to shout out what they think is a difficult conversation? What does it mean? We've got a couple up here. People telling the truth. I should hope telling the truth isn't, isn't difficult. That, that's probably, there's not a lot of context to that, you know. Um, I had a coaching conversation with someone yesterday um, who was struggling because they said, oh, look, there's someone in my team um, who doesn't trust what I say because they think, I think they're a shit developer. And I said, do you think they're a shit developer? And they paused. I went, okay. <laughs> All right. So what's the problem? They're like, oh, I can see some areas of improvement that they need that they're probably not good at. But, you know I, don't know, I don't know how to tell them. I was like, what you've just said is perfect. If you came up to me and said, Phil, you're really shit at that, what's going to happen? I'm going to get angry. I'm going to get defensive. Most of Well, I'm not, but, you know, a, a normal person would. I'm a bit of a weirdo. But... Telling the truth is difficult in some situations, but what's worse is blowing smoke up that person and continuing to tell them they're, they're amazing because smart people will see right through that and it becomes disingenuous. So they're not gonna listen to things that you say. They're not gonna take your advice. They're not gonna take your help. So telling the truth is really, really important. It's how you phrase it. Again, I go back to that saying, if I'm giving feedback, it has to be for you. So I can't tell you your shit just to make myself feel better. No one wants to be bad at their job, right? Does anybody here want to be better at the job? It's okay if you want to be, that's fine. Sometimes I am. You can, you can go to them and say, hey, you just think, how can I make that person's life better? How can I help them improve so they're not shit anymore? What can I do to help them grow? If you think about it that way, that's your purpose, right? That's your purpose, the outcomes are relevant. That's your purpose. And so if you approach the conversation with that thought process and with that manner and with that preparation, it'll be easier. What else have we got up here? There's some very specific ones. Um, I think this is trying to exp try explaining to sales that we product team needs to understand why before we can build. <laughs> sounds like that's a pretty common interaction by the sounds of those laughs. You've pretty much answered your own question by this. Why? 
when, the, when, there's a, when there's a misunderstanding of things or a misunderstanding of opinions, etc., it's because there's no clarity. There's no clarity of direction. One person thinks one way, the other person thinks another, right? Has so anybody heard of the technique called the five whys? Yeah. It's pretty, pretty old, you know, Satishi Toyota, started the Toyota company. Um, does anybody know the story behind it? I love it. It's really, really quick. Um, so basically, invented the five whys. An engineer, it was an engineering problem, how to get to the root cause of any engineering problem. And it works with people as well. The engineer came to him because the, uh, the um, cam belts kept snapping on engines. He said, the t-shirt kept snapping. And he said, why? Oh, well, our idlers and our tensioners are too tight. Well, why? Oh, because we've got the wrong sprockets in them. Well, why? Oh, because our computer system ordered the wrong thing. Why? Oh, we've installed the wrong software. Cool. So the cam belt problem goes all the way back to the root cause of having the wrong software. And it's very, very seldom that you ask why once and you're at the root cause of a problem. It's very, very seldom. Because we're humans, right? I'm not going to go into it now because I'll speak forever, but the, the human behavior iceberg model, we see people's behaviors. There's a heap of stuff below the surface that we don't see that drives their behaviors from thoughts and needs and emotions and beliefs and values um, really drive. So asking why and asking questions to uncover that stuff helps you understand. What I said earlier about the person going on a racist rant and I would ask questions to understand why they've said it. When someone says something polemic or racist or angry, we attack or we defend. That doesn't really get us anywhere except creating more anger and more hate and you see it on social media all the time. Another good TED talk and I'll share it. There's a chap that started, was getting hate online for being homosexual and instead of getting angry about it, he approached every single one of them and said, why did you think it was okay to say that? Why did you feel that you could say that to me? And really ask questions. And a few of them came out and just said, oh, I'm also homosexual and I've been getting hate online because there's other people. And he understood where they were coming from. Empathy is not an endorsement. It is okay for me to understand where you're coming from. It doesn't mean I agree with you. It doesn't mean I have to. But the more I understand things, the better I can address the problem, right? Does that make sense? Any questions or thoughts there? You're all so quiet. Come on. What else have we got? Who's got something burning that they might not have put up here? Does anybody want to share something? Oh, this is a good one. How to make yourself vulnerable in a room full of leaders. This is great. And it's difficult, right? It takes bravery to be vulnerable. But vulnerability, vulnerability is, is an amazing tool to build trust. It's probably the best, right? People come up to me all the time and say, oh, how do I build trust? Vulnerability. If you're a new people leading a team and you suddenly start coming in and barking orders and telling people how to do things, they're probably not going to accept you very quickly, right? But if you come in and say something along that, show a little bit of vulnerability. You could say, hey guys, I'm, I'm really new in this role. I understand that a couple of others have, have applied for the same role and you're probably upset that you didn't get it. It wasn't my choice. I'm really happy being in the role. And I really want us to succeed as a team. What can I do to engage you guys? What can I do to make you all better? Or even, even further and just say, I, I don't know everything. I'm going to need your help. Asking for help is a great way to show vulnerability. And good leaders, if you're in a room full of senior leaders, good leaders, they love to help people. You don't become a good leader if you don't like helping people. You just don't. All the bad leaders out there they just don't like helping people. They're out there to make money. But by helping people, so ask, let's say, put your hand up and say, hey, look, I don't know that. That's what I said earlier. I think it was step four. If you don't know, say you don't know. It's a great way to build trust. And the opposite side of it is people looking and go, oh, cool, this person's not afraid to ask a question. This person's not afraid to show vulnerability. How to professionally agree and disagree. Why do you have to do it professionally? What does that mean? It's okay to disagree and agree. What I suggest is, so instead of me attacking, again, I go back to the, as humans, we attack, we defend. I'm going to use you again, Matt, because you're there. If you say something I disagree with, if I just go, oh, yeah, I don't agree with that, what happens? Little to nothing except anger. If I just say, hey, what do you mean by that? What, why, do you, why do you think that? and really, really asking and uncovering, and keep going until they can't say anymore, until you actually have clarity. If you ask enough questions, you'll get to that root cause, and you'll understand. 
sorry I'm being repetitive, but as I said earlier, I'll go back to questions all the time. It's my answer for everything. Ask more questions. If there's anger or a conflict between people, unless there's a personal hatred of one another, it is generally because there is a core misunderstanding. Or non-understanding as well. Please throw in if you feel that I'm not answering these well enough for you. I won't go through it. How do you deal with pessimism? Well, again, it's, you, you can ask, some people are just going to be pessimistic. I call it the Eeyore effect. You know what Eeyore, anybody watch Winnie the Pooh growing up? Poor Eeyore, he was always sad. Poor little guy. But look, again, dealing with pessimism, it's like, hey, what, why, you know, why, you, you, can, you, can, you can acknowledge, you can only do it using I language. When you use you language, it's accusative. So I'm like, you know, you, you're not engaging in our conversation, man. You're really, really not. So what are you going to do about it? Sorry to... <laughs> but it's, it's aggressive, right? I say, hey, look, I've, I've noticed that you're, you're not being as, as open as some as the others. Is there a reason for that? And they might go, oh, no, no. It's like, do, is, is there a way that you prefer to communicate? Again, you're asking questions. And because I'm saying I, it's an observation. You can't argue with my observation. It's very difficult. Because it's something that I've noticed. It's something that I've seen. And I could be wrong. You go, oh, no, no, I'm just quiet today. And maybe he's had a bad day. Maybe something's happened at home. Maybe he's not feeling very well. If you use you language, you're assuming and you're accusative. So that's something really, really simple you can do straight away. To get through that pessimism, to get through for giving feedback or receiving feedback, switch your use around eyes. And if you can't, don't give the feedback. Oh, this is so much fun. How not to suck at difficult conversations. Oh, look, practice practice. There's no silver bullet. Disclaimer, you will not leave here being suddenly amazing at having conversations. <laughs> but you didn't know that one. Half of you going to leave now. Fuck. Look, it, it takes practice. And, and the stuff that I'm saying works for me. And it works in general as well. And, and I think it will work for most people. But it's finding your own way and, and finding your own practice. I'm going to give you a framework that I used to follow and still do on occasions because it's absolutely bulletproof. But I've gone away with it. I've, I've gone away from it. I've found my own way. And you will. And you can only do it through practice. I've interviewed in the last 10 years close to 8,000 people. I've coached close to about eight, close to a couple of hundred. So... I'm constantly practicing conversations. And then you do it in your own personal life, right? So you're engaging with family members that you may or may not like. Oh, I have politics. Oh, I disagree with my, you know, you just have to stay out of those conversations. But it takes practice. And you won't always get it right. You won't. You just won't. Even as, as much as I've done it, I, I get it wrong because we're humans, right? Just, there's always that one person or that one thing that you can't reach to. What's that line from that really awesome Batman movie? Some people just want to watch the world burn. There is that one person. Um, I'm going to move on. I will do one more and then I'm going to move on and we can talk more about this because I'm, I'm very wary of how much I talk and how much we will run out of time. How to distance myself. Oh, this is a good one. How to distance myself from the feedback to avoid the shooting the messages situation. That comes back to what you said earlier about taking the emotion out of it. Essentially, you're not in it because there's no, there shouldn't be an emotional attachment to something. You ever heard the saying it's okay to to be emotional, it's not okay to get emotional. Emotions are normal, They're completely normal. It's okay to get angry. It's not okay to be angry in a conversation. It's okay to get sad. It's okay to be sad too. But when it comes to those aggressive natures, it's not really okay because it doesn't get you anywhere. But you've still got to acknowledge that emotion because you can't have a true conversation if you're not being authentic. And emotions are part of being authentic. To remove yourself from shooting the messenger, look, that, that's about delivering the message. If you focus on the purpose, there's nothing worse, right? If I come up to Matt, I'm like, Matt, I'm real sorry, bro. Like, you're really not going to, what am I sorry for? You're not going to get your pay rise. It's, it, I'm putting emotion in that situation as opposed to focusing on my purpose, focusing on the process that I followed to get to that outcome for that purpose. I shouldn't have used the word outcome, but to get to that purpose, right? Does that make sense? Anybody disagree or want to stretch that out a bit further? Everybody's so friendly. I normally get people yelling at me by this time. Cool. I'm going to move on from this a little bit. I guess that the victim, that, that quote that was mine, yeah. what I was looking for is, um, and sometimes, what, what I was looking for is, what are the verbals or the mechanism 
chance of the liberty being used. Mm -hmm. So you minimize the chance of the other side thinking that it's just a you versus them. Right. So are you talking about third party information? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, okay. Um, sometimes you're there, you have a role, a responsibility yeah. to deliver that message. Yep. It doesn't matter how confident you are. Yeah. Like Yeah. And then you end up being the shooting, the messenger. Yeah, okay. Because, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm going to antagonize you uh, just because you're the one delivering the message. Okay. Don't antagonize them. <laughs> no, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. No, and that's actually a really, that's actually quite a difficult situation. I'm glad you clarified that. Thank you. What was your name, sorry? Lorenzo, thank you for that. Third party feedback, third party information, when I have a role and it is my job to pass something on. Now this happens in a lot of companies. Uh, we ourselves at Zero, we have people leads who may not work in your team, but they're responsible for you. And so they don't observe what you do all the time. Now feedback's easy to give and it's the best way when you observe it. And I always try to say, if you haven't observed the situation, don't give the feedback. Um, sometimes, very few times it's unavoidable. And again, it, it comes down to your eye language and asking questions. So let's say, for example, um, Alex has come to me and said, again, I'm going to pick on you again, Matt, you're just in my peripheries. Um, Alex has come and said, look, Phil, um, Matt's not turning up to work. He's, you know, he's been really tardy. He's, he's not putting in as many pull requests as everybody else, and it's a real problem. Now, I haven't observed this. It's coming from Alex. So I'll, I'll, go, to, I'll go to Matt. And I'll say, hey, Matt, can I give you some feedback? Awesome. Thanks, mate. Look, I've just been talking to some of the team, and I'm hearing that, again, I'm using eye language. I, I, I'm, I'm hearing a couple of things that I'm a little concerned about, so I just wanted to ask you about them. So I've heard that you've been turning up to work late recently. Is that true? Okay. <laughs> and that's good. It's rubbish? Okay. Okay, cool. So I've heard that. Why, why do you think there's that perception? Just lies. Why do you think? What? Why do you think your team would lie about you? I'm too far down this path. Yeah, you're too far down. <laughs> so wouldn't you, and I can keep. I can keep going. So if someone took the lies angle, I'd go along because that's disciplinary, right? If someone, if there's actually that toxicity within a team and people are lying, I'd have to say, okay, well that that's a really serious allegation, mate. And I, if if that's true, if you truly believe that, to protect you and to make this team better, I need to follow that up. Are you okay with me doing that? Yeah, sure. Cool, awesome. And then you build a plan from there, right? That's kind of an extreme example, but what I've done is, again, I've used I language because I have to, I'm not gonna throw Alex under the bus and tell him that it's Alex that's told me because that causes another problem. And it might come to that. If it comes to that, that's when you're getting HR involved. So that's a different conversation again. That's an outcome. My purpose is to find out if what Alex is telling me is true. Because I haven't observed it, so I don't know, right? Does that sort of give you a couple of hints? Again, it's a difficult situation. We'll role play it soon. Awesome. This is going to be fun. And, and look, it, it, like, I said, like I said earlier at the beginning of this, I could talk about this for hours. This is a really, really brief sort of overview of some stuff. There's going to be a million different situations, so many different types of difficult conversations. Um, I did a talk like this once, and someone came up to me and goes, how do you tell people that somebody died? I was like, holy shit, that's a difficult conversation. And, and that was, you know, out of the blue. And I was like, well, you can't really talk about your purpose there. Um, <laughs> but there's lots of different types of difficult conversations. So we can do some scenario-based stuff, and I'll, I'll share my contact details, so if you want to chat through more after. But I really wanted to focus on feedback, and we've covered it again. So I'm going to give you some really, really quick tips. How long have we got? Oh, sweet, awesome. I want about half an hour for us to, to role-play and practice. Generally speaking, the difficult conversations that we have in the workplace is some form of giving feedback. Would most people agree with that? Yep. Comes up a lot, right? So when you're having a disagreement with someone, there's a purpose, there's a reason behind it, you need to give feedback. Um, or, yeah, I've been, giving, who's, I've been giving feedback since I could talk. Mum, I don't like my food. I don't want to go out this way. It's all feedback. Um, and so feedback is what we're going to touch on today. So what do you think feedback is? Just throw stuff at me. What do you think it is? A response to a response. You've been listening. You're onto this. You're so present. A response to an observation. Absolutely. Uh, sorry, Alex. What did you say? 
you give you a perception. Mm, is it? It can be. That's why I say it's got to be an observation. Yeah. Right? So it's not a perception. And, and, and so if it is a perception, okay, so if you, let's say, um, let, what's, what's perception? Okay, Matt, Matt's turning up late, right? So I perceive that he's just lazy and he doesn't care about the team. So it might be your assumption. Yeah, assumption. There you go. Better word. Much better word. What I can do to give proper feedback is I've got to get past those assumptions. How do you think I'd do that? Ah, oh, so good! Asking questions, absolutely. Matt, I'm addressing an observation. Matt, I've noticed that you've been turning up to work lately quite a lot. Is there a reason for that? Uh, yep, because I've been staying late. Oh, cool. And, and then you can follow on from there. Oh, man, we don't want you staying late because it's important to get you sleep. Is there anything that I can do to help you with your workload? You know, you can continue the conversation. But instead of me suddenly thinking Let's, Matt's just lazy and doesn't care about the company, I actually know he's been working bloody hard, right? So try to cut through assumptions. What else is that? You've pretty much nailed it. Feedback is a response to an observation, essentially. There's lots of other stuff that goes with it, but if you had to put a di dictionary definition, it's feedback to it. What isn't feedback or shouldn't be involved in feedback? Throw them, there's lots. Yeah, man, go for it. Absolutely, that's a very good point. Useless feedback, feedback that doesn't matter. I, and a, I run a feedback course here and someone said, how do I give feedback to a team member that they're typing too hard? <laughs> and the old grumpy man from Dunedin and me just said, wanted to say, just harden up and piss off. But of course you can't do that. So the, the reality was you go through a process and you get to the point that, you know, the giving of that feedback to someone is probably down an extreme end when really they can just put on a set of headphones and they can take themselves. They can manage it another way. It's not important enough. The feedback was not going to be for that person. It was going to be for them. So don't give it. What else isn't it? There's lots of stuff. Do you have an opinion? So feelings and opinions. Yes, absolutely. Good. Throw them out. Don't put your hand up. I'm not a school teacher. Personal attacks. Absolutely. Insults. Personal attacks. Grudges. Angry things. Not feedback. Anything that is for you and not for that person is not feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's a good one. That's a really, really good one. Those passive-aggressive snide remarks that sometimes that poor leaders come through. I shouldn't say poor leaders, untrained leaders. Let's give them... How do you respond to feedback like that? How would you, how would you respond to it? Mm -hmm. And the feedback was, as a senior web developer, that's what they said to me. As a for me. <laughs> I love that. When they tell you your title, as a senior web developer, you just yeah. say, actually, yeah. I'm a human. Yeah. Oh, good. Sounds like you handled it perfectly. He's been promoted. Well done. You should, be, you should come up here and teach him how to do it. <laughs> Look, it's, it's all, I, without being there, it's hard to say. But it's, it's easy for me, again, if someone insults me, I say, why do you think it was okay to say that to me? Do you think that's appropriate in a, in a workplace? And most people will go, oh, yeah, sorry. I was like, why did you say it? Like, oh, look, I'm having a bad day. I'm angry. Hardy's just cut my pay rate. Or, I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's the vicious manager. But, yeah, that's essentially what... Uh, there's lots of other things that aren't feedback. Um, ice cream's not feedback. Coffee's not feedback. Those are items. Um, what about receiving feedback? So people ask this a lot. They're like, okay, you've taught us how to... What, if, what about... How do I take feedback better and there was one up there as well how do I not take feedback personally how do I well look it depends how it's delivered if it's delivered well then you shouldn't because this amazing person is coming to give you feedback and it's all about you it's about making your life better look if you ever have to give feedback the quickest way what do you think the quickest way is to drop that person's guard and get them thinking about themselves and shift that power I've said it twice already I think Nailed it. Matt cheats because Matt's been on my feedback course. Absolutely. Ask them if they want it. Ask permission. 
And I don't mean saying, hey, do you have time for a chat? Because that's scary. <laughs> don't do that. Hey, can we have a chat? It's non-specific. You don't know what's happening, right? And it doesn't really shift power. Hey. Yeah. Oh, well, fuck. Don't do that either. <laughs> I'm like, no, we don't. We're running away. Can't dump me. I'm leaving. Um, no, it's just asking simple, simple permission, right? You've gone through your thought process. You have your purpose of why you're delivering your feedback. You've got to do it. Hey, Alex, do you mind if I give you some feedback? Yep. Cool. What's happened there? Most people will say yes, some won't. It's very casual. Yeah, it's casual, right? And I've shifted the power. He has the power. He can say yes or no. And because he said yes, he's likely to lean in and he's more receptive to what I'm going to say, regardless of what it is. And then I'm going to deliver amazing feedback, right? But you have the power. If you say no, I'm going to say, is there a reason for that? Again, just going to that question. Is, you know, what, or you could just say why. And they might go, hey, look, I'm busy right now. You know, oh, cool. When's a better time for you? Again, it's, and never, I say, okay, that, and, and look, that's, that's, that's very good, I like this, okay, okay, look, it, it's up to you, but I've got some really important feedback to give you that I think will help you in your career progression. i tell you what, you've got my email address, you've got me on Slack, if you feel that you want to hear it, just ping me, okay? okay? Cool. If he doesn't, and it's important to the business, then it's an HR problem, right? So that's that time you've hit that pessimistic person that really, but I guarantee you, in about five minutes or five hours or whenever, when Alex has calmed down, he's going to ping me and say, hey, I'm really keen to get that feedback from you. And it's happened to me many, many times. Many, many times. But it shifts the power because they're the important person in the conversation. So guarantee you, if you're having problems with somebody or you're butting heads when it has to give permission, you know, even your product teams, go to your product manager, hey, can I give you some feedback over that last stand-up? Be descriptive about it, and because they want, most people want to know, right? Most people want to grow. It's a good start. And and asking questions to clarify. So if, if you're receiving the feedback, if you don't agree with it, don't just take it. And I know that's difficult because as Kiwis and as well, we're not all Kiwis. That's a bit generalised. But as people, we we generally avoid conflict. And you know, disc profiling and psychology will show that most people within, generally speaking, again, most people within technology or development disciplines tend to sit in what we call a CS space, which is sort of conservative and, and supportive. They really like accuracy and detail and tend to avoid conflict. Tend to. So, asking questions to clarify. What do I mean? What do you mean by that? Hey, look. I, I, Anthony, I really need you to get better at pull requests. What does better mean? What do you mean by that? Oh, look, we need you to be sub submitting more because we've got a release that we have to get to, so we really need that. Oh, cool. I understand what that means now. Instead of just going, oh, I've just been told I'm shit. I'm not going to ask a question and you walk away. Asking questions to clarify. And it's from both as well. If you're delivering the feedback and you've delivered it and you see that their shoulders have shrunk or you know, they've put their hands in their pockets, because we can pick up on body language, right? pushing my glasses in. Um, so if you notice that happening, just say, does that make sense? Do you need any more help from me? And why would you ask them if they want help? Because it's for them, right? Asking questions to clarify is something that I've observed in my experience is something that we are terrible at. And as simple as, I've had so many conflicts where they've said, Phil, we need you to mediate this. And it's simply because two people are in the same room saying the same thing and they don't know it. Or somebody's used a word that the person doesn't understand and they haven't felt safe enough or they haven't felt confident enough to ask the question why. Guarantee you it is difficult, but it'll make life so much better. Really important. Thanking someone that gives you feedback. Why? Come on. Sorry? They're going to do it again. Giving feedback is hard, and especially if it's difficult feedback. Especially if you're struggling to separate your purpose from your outcome, and you've overthunk things a little bit, because we still will do that. We're all humans. We do it. We want to protect people. Thank them. It's difficult, and they'll give it to you again. One of the best ways we grow as humans and professionally is by getting feedback and learning and growing. If we don't thank people, they're not going to give us feedback again. So we've, we've kind of covered this off. Um, yes, at the back, my man, what's up? Um, one more point on receiving feedback. Yes. Uh, I was given the step was to never ask for feedback from the other person. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Absolutely. Absolutely. Argument serves no purpose. Again, that comes back to that attack or defend. Hate begetting hate doesn't get you anywhere. Understanding that sweet spot right in the middle, that empathy. Again, it's not an endorsement. You don't have to agree with them. But thanking them sort of ends that. Does anybody here struggle with taking compliments? Someone gives you a compliment and you're like, yeah, man, I do. You wouldn't expect it, right? I'm like, keep them coming. Keep them coming at me. I find it difficult to take compliments. And when someone says, oh, you're looking real good, you're like, oh, no, no, I've actually put on some weight. Or, oh, no, it's just the light. Or, you know, I just haven't eaten in three days. Um, <laughs> whatever it might be. Just say thank you. They've given you a compliment. And as hard as it is to give constructive feedback or critical, I don't like saying negative. There's no such thing as negative feedback. Because it's for them. It's about to make their life better. So it's constructive. Or it's critical. It's not negative. Positive feedback's difficult to give sometimes as well. Because again, if you don't know the person, you don't know them overly well, that person might not like open praise. They might not like um, to, you know, to be touched or hugged or high-fived or whatever. Um, so again, ask questions to clarify around that. How do you like to be praised? How do you, what does recognition look like for you? But if you just say thank you, they're going to do it again. And it makes you feel better as well. If someone gives you a nice compliment, they're like, man, you look good in those glasses. I've, I've just recently got glasses. This is very really poignant for me. About three weeks ago, and somebody came up to me and said, oh, wow, you're like one of the only people I know that looks better in glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, High five. Um, yeah. Um, what if you have a problem and you talk to someone about it and they give you feedback, but Mm. Like the can you can you give me an example? So so that to me, like without knowing your example, that sounds like advice. So advice and feedback are very different things. So again, feedback is a response to an observation. So hey, I've noticed this. That's the feedback, right? Essentially, there's more to it than that. Can you give me an example? Yep. And I gave some advice to the BA about how they could um, separate the acceptance criteria from the requirements so that you have um, a list of what the program's supposed to do and then for the developers, what are we actually changing? Let's use the right. Yeah. So if it was separate, then this, what am I changing? Yeah, so that, that's, that's a very good, and a very common situation. Um, nobody likes to be told how do they, they do their job, right? Whether, whether you're right or wrong is irrelevant. People go, oh, somebody's telling me how to do something better. The way you frame it, and a, a, I'm going to take it to a really, really simple example, because um, my aunt is you know, in her 60s and works in an office, and she's like, oh, we've got this new woman, Beth, and she's just so slow. She doesn't know how to use smart keys, and she can't just do control F to find things. She goes through everything line by line, and I keep telling her she needs to do this. I'm like, well, how does Beth respond to that? And she's like, oh, she doesn't listen to me. Of course she doesn't because you're yelling at her. Well, and I'm not saying you were yelling, but you're making a directive. So the way that you can change that is, is by, again, thinking, how can I make it for that person? So I just said to my aunt, hey, try this. Hey, Beth, can I show something that's going to make your life easier? Beth's like, yes, please. Well, you know you're doing all these tables. Well, you just, if you hit Control F, it's going to cut all your time down. So you could say something like, okay, last time I found that the requirements weren't as clear as what I need them to be to do my job. Um, so that we can work better together, have you thought about this? Again, you're, you're framing your advice in the form of a question, because when you don't, when you say, this is how you do things, you're not giving them a choice, you're not giving them an option, you're not really giving them any wiggle room to argue with you or to come back or to voice their opinion. And again, they may be completely wrong, but when you form it in the way of a question, have you thought about this? Do you think this could work? So try that. Do you think that might work? Um, I just did it there. Yeah. Um, so it started with, you know, why I couldn't understand it, and then eventually ended up with an example. In, um, anybody else been in that situation that has a thought, or has that happened to you before? Hardy? Quite often the forum of when to give the feedback happens. So in some cases you use the battle, as in like, you know, you, you go with a suboptimal output, but then you wait at the retrospective, for example, where everybody believes in their feedback, and maybe you go back and you raise the game. So quite often... Yeah. Or 
even harder. No you, you don't have they, they have company, no. Right. You and I are going to take this offline, and I'm going to help you with that because that's a tricky problem, and I like that. Um, look, what Hardy said there about the, the, the forum, I like to call it the environment. The environment's essential, essential to giving feedback. I'm not going to give Alex personal feedback in a room full of people, right? It's not the right environment. If he's having a bad day, if he's angry, if he's distracted by his workload, if he's you know, having problems at home, it's not the right environment. I say environment, not just the space that you're in, but the mental space that you're in, the mental health of the person. And I'm not saying mental health and mental illness are two very, very different things. We all struggle with mental health. So it's important to understand those things, understand your environment. Is it the right time and place? And it's very difficult when you're remote. So I'd, I'll come and have a chat with you in a minute and, and discuss that if you'd like to. Why don't you have time? Well, that's exactly right, because it will save time, and that's, that's the issue. So you what, know, what if I... Save time, so that, like, after you implement something, you're just going to have more time available. Ask some questions. Instead of directive, again, hey, what if I could... You seem really, really busy. What if, what, what if I could save you some time? What if I could show you something that would save you some time? And if they go, oh, that wouldn't. I was like, okay. Do you understand the process? And, and continue asking them questions. And look, at the end of the day, I make it sound really, really easy. You can only flog a dead horse for so long, mate. If it gets to the point where someone's just really not getting it, they're probably in the wrong role. There's probably a, a lack of training there. They probably need something. That's when you go to HR and say, look, this is a situation. I really want to help this person. I've, done, I've followed this, this, and this step. What do you, what do you recommend? Um, I think there's a training gap there. You know, they've come in as a senior and really they're a junior intermediate. We need to fix that. Hardy, yeah. Oh. Hey, do you think we can try this as an experiment for a week and it doesn't work, we go back to the old habits. And sometimes when you say, hey, it's finite, yep. it's not going to work, it's not there permanent, we'll try it out, we'll throw it away. It's uh, more effective because the, you know, the, the stakes are a lot lower now. It's very good advice. It's very, very good advice. It's like that 90 day trial, right? Um, your feedback conversation is playing out in slightly different human hierarchies. Yeah. Absolutely, and that's feedback in itself. And uh, so, showing vulnerability. So it's a great way. Again, it's just one way. There's lots of others. But if there's a power imbalance, which often happens, uh, it's funny. The first piece of feedback I had to give when I first started at Zero was to Rod Drury um, about him being late um, to a meeting. And and then the next one was about you know he had a he had a certain opinion of using contractors. I, as the expert in recruitment at the time, had a more informed opinion. And so, you know, but. That power imbalance was easy to shift because I showed some vulnerability. Um, as a leader, it's really powerful if you can, but you're 100% right. If, if you know there's a lack of trust, if you know there's a breakage there, a shift in dynamic, you need to work on fixing that relationship first. And that is through feedback and asking questions as well. You can acknowledge it. You say, hey, look, I've noticed um, that when we talk to each other, there seems like there's a little bit of tension. Would that be fair to say? And they might go, oh, no, no, I'm fine. You go, okay. Well, look, I, I, I feel that there is, because a couple of times last week, do you remember last week when we had that conversation, I said this, and, and you kind of dismissed me a little bit. Was there a reason for that? And again, you can still follow that questioning model. You know, I make it sound very, very easy. And again, I do it because I've practiced it a lot. But it works. It does work. you just got to take a different tack to it. And understanding that situation, if you don't know that there's a lack of trust, well, that makes it even harder, right? So that comes into knowing that person and what I spoke about earlier about that, that iceberg model, which I'm not going to draw because I'm terrible, but understanding what drives people's behaviours. People just don't do things for the sake of doing it. There's a driver. It's a value. It's a belief. It's something else. There's something else going on. We're going to move forward real, real quickly because we are running out of time. So we've spoken about a few of the challenges. This is a really basic model that you can follow. Anybody heard of SBI before? Yeah, Matty has, obviously, yeah. So the normal model is that, and I've just added an A to it. So situation, behavior, impact, action. If you follow this recipe, if you like, it, it, it makes the conversation easier. 
And so acknowledging the situation. Hey, do you remember that stand-up we had last week? It takes the person that you're speaking to back to that moment. Hopefully it's within a couple of days because feedback, it's important to be timely, right? You don't want to be doing it six months later, okay? So you're getting them, this is to get them back into that mindset, cool. Remember we were in that, in that stand-up last week, I noticed using I language, not you language, talking about the behavior, what actually happened. I noticed that you were speaking really, really loudly and passionately and all the time went past and nobody else got a chance to put their opinion forward. What's the impact of that? When that happens, some of the team are less likely to engage with you. It makes it harder for us to move forward because we are in a pod and we really need to move forward as a team here. Action. What are we going to do to fix it? What are we going to do moving forward? Now, that's, if you do it that way, you're ticking the box. The dots are for questions. Right? That's an opportunity for question. Hey, remember that, remember that uh, stand-up we had last week? And they might go, oh, no. They're like, oh, do you remember that you said this, this, and this? Oh, yeah, cool. You generally wouldn't need to ask questions there. All right? Behavior. I noticed that you are really, really passionate. You are, you're speaking over a few people. Is, is there a reason for that? And it might be that they didn't, don't agree with other people's opinions or they feel that they know what other people are going to say. Rah, rah. It might be because they're having a bad day. So let's just say it's because they're having a bad day. It's like, oh, you know, I'm having trouble at home. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Is there anything I can do to help? That's when it changes and goes in a different direction. But let's say for shits and giggles is that they just aren't aware of what's going on. Okay, cool. Then they're not aware. So oh, I didn't really notice. Okay, cool. Well, <coughs> it's something I observed. You can go back to the situation again. That You don't have to follow it like this. You can chop and change. So they're not aware of it. So when you speak like that, the impact that it has on the team, you know, we struggle to move forward. People feel like they can't bring their opinions to the fold. What can we do? A question. What can we do next time? What can I do? What can we do so that you can still get your opinion forward, but everybody else gets a chance to talk as well? What I'm doing by answering that question there and shifting the power, because again, very few people want to be that loud person in the room that's taking all the time, right? So you, there's always one, <laughs> there's always somebody, but they'll say, oh, you know, perhaps, you know, as Hardy just did to me before when he did that, you know, perhaps you can just give me a little signal and I know that it's my turn to stop talking. Cool. So moving forward, what I'm going to do is, in our next stand-up, I'll just make eye contact with you. I'll just tap my watch a little bit if I, if I think you're going too far. And what I'd really like you to do is ask a question of the team. Ask them for their opinions so they feel interacted and that'll build trust with you. I know I ripped through that really, really quickly, but does that, that model make sense? Do you see how that could work? Situation. Where were we? Behaviour. What have I observed? Eye language, because when you get into the you, it's finger pointing and it's no good. What's the impact? I go back to the guy who's doing the typing. The impact is only on him, so it doesn't matter. It's not important. If the impact's on the team, if the impact's on other people, you know, and again, if, if it's for that person, again, if somebody's underperforming, look, I've noticed that you're not getting as many pull requests in. Is there a reason for that? Oh, no. Nah. Well, you know, when you're not, it really creates a problem for the team. They've got to pick up the slack. You don't want that. You know, and you continue from there. Action. Well, there's clearly a training opportunity here. I'm going to implement some stuff for you. We're going to get some training. I'm going to mentor you, whatever it might be. It, it works in every situation, whether someone's combative. And if someone's combative, that's when you stop at the dots and ask questions. Have I given you all enough information that you would feel comfortable with taking a scenario and practicing that with amongst yourselves? So what I would like to do is put you into threes and have someone to give the feedback, someone to receive it, and someone to observe. So the observer, back to time, yeah. So the observer's going to, and it only has to be a quick 30 seconds, you have to rip through it. It doesn't have to be a long-winded conversation. But then just at the end, just tell them what you felt worked well and what they could do differently. Now, it's a role-play situation practice situation, hate the term role play, it's not real world, so there's always going to be something you can improve on, there's always going to be something you can do better. The purpose of this is so that you can practice SBIA. And it's one of many, many frameworks. This is quite a, SBI is quite a famous framework, it's been around for a long, long time. It is bulletproof. I've, in my however many years of giving feedback and having difficult conversations, this has never not worked for me. It's got to the point a couple of times where there is no resolution, and sometimes there is no resolution, but that's a resolution in itself. The person leaves, 
you take them down a HR process. Everybody comfortable with doing this? All right, so just grab the couple of people around you, turn around. I'll give, I'll give you a really, really simple scenario you can use. If you don't have one already, I, w I would suggest practicing with a real life one, maybe that you've come up with. Um, using the one where the person's turning up late is a great one. It's nice and easy. As the person receiving the feedback, feel free to chuck in a couple of mean ones in there, but try not to, be nice to people. I love that line, eh? It's not about you. How was that? How did you find that? It's difficult, right? It's challenging. What, why was it challenging? Um, just to try and, try and think about a situation on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's difficult, right? They're practicing role playing. It's hard. It's non real and you don't know people as well. So, it, it, is, it is difficult at times. So, I appreciate all, all of you participating in that. I really, really do. It is quite difficult. So, thank you for that. What did, what did you learn? What worked, what worked well? Alex? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Preparing your purpose, preparing your feedback, understanding, understanding why you're giving it. Why am I giving it? It's really important. Awesome, thanks mate. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, oh absolutely it is. It definitely is, and that's why I go back to this. You will not leave here being amazing at giving feedback. You will not leave here being amazing at giving, having difficult conversations. Hopefully, you'll be a little bit better. Hopefully, a couple of things, a couple of light bulb moments, perhaps. Maybe it'll spark something. You go, you know what? I want to go learn more about that. I want to go research more. I'm going to practice more. You've got to practice. You've got to find your vibe, your flow, your way, your language. If you all spoke like me, Jesus, we'd be in trouble. Awesome. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, absolutely. Do you, do you two mind if I share an insight that I had through your conversation? Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, look, great, great conversations over here, and exactly what you just said happened um, through whatever reason. And, and is it Diogo? Is that how I pronounce your name? Diogo? Thanks. Nailed it. Um, asked great questions to clarify. So, Isabella? Nailed it. Um, Isabella, um, you know, put forward an observation, missed the impact part. So Diogo straight away said, what, what do you mean by, so she asked, she said, I've, I've noticed that you're a little bit down and you haven't been overly productive. And he goes, well, haven't I been productive? What does productive look like to you? And so great question to clarify. And as a receiver of feedback, if you don't understand, don't sit and take it. Awesome, mate, well done. And, and you followed up quite well as well. And then you gave him some really great options. So excellent interaction there. Ace stars for both. <laughs> Either of you can be my team lead at any time. You would not want to be. Anything else? What did you learn? What would you, yeah? I think you focus on the fact, if you learn to focus on the fact, even though it's a problem, yeah. but you try not to say that it's a personal problem rather than it's a fact. Yeah. The hardest piece of feedback I ever had to give to someone was to tell them that they had really bad breath. As a recruiter, I was a young recruiter, um, and a CV came across my desk for, a, for a, a program manager in Wellington. It was an amazing CV. An evil agency recruitment world, we would call that a walking invoice. Like, this is something I can place anywhere and make some money, right? And he rings me up. He's like, Phil, I'm, I'm, I'm getting lots of interviews, but I'm not getting any jobs. I was like, why? Okay. Met him. As soon as he walked in the door and introduced himself, it was like being punched in the face. I couldn't. It was so strong. It was really, really strong. And here's someone, I was like 25, 26, and he was in his 50s and, you know, salary five times what I was, you know, massive power imbalance, right? And after about 10 minutes, I had to say to him, hey, mate, do you mind if I give you some feedback? Are you aware that you have really strong breath? And it's difficult because just like um, you said, it's hard to come up with it because I hadn't prepared that. I didn't know he was going to have bad breath. But, and, and of course, he straight away went like that, and he was kind of offended um, or taken aback. And I said, look, I'm, I'm not trying to embarrass you, but your CV is amazing. So I guarantee you that that is why you're not getting the job. I can't concentrate because of how strong your breath is. And of course, he left. And he stood up and said, I don't have to take this. And he walked out. Two weeks later, and I know it sounds like a made-up story, but it's 100% not. We're still friends now. Two weeks later, he ran me up and said, Phil, I've got a job at MB. 
And I was like, awesome, mate, well done. Why are you calling me? He's like, I went, to the, I went home to my wife and I was bitching and moaning about what an asshole you were. And she said, why? He's like, he told me I had bad breath. And she goes, you know, honey, you do. <laughs> and she'd been living with it, but didn't know how to tell him because she didn't want to offend him. She didn't want to make him mad, all these types of things. So he went to the dentist, had a halitosis, got it sorted, breath all fine, gone, gets a job. The purpose was for him. And sometimes it's difficult, right? What would you do differently? What have you learned that you're going to try differently when you go back to work? Nothing. Jesus failed miserably. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing I learned was that um, it was just good doing the role play. So if you could find someone trusted that you were trusted by that, yeah, I'm going to do that. My man. Awesome. Do it. Go home. Find your partner. Find your cat. You probably won't get much out of your cat. But find somebody, work colleague, someone, someone that you can practice with. You know, if you're reasonably talented, do it in a mirror and put on conversation. It is difficult, but, you know, practice. Awesome, man. I'm really happy about that because that, that's, that's the only way you'll learn. And, it's, and it takes that anxiety away. Because like I said, the whole amygdala hippocampus thing kicks in. Way you can, you know, the best way to mitigate that is to practice breathing, by the way, because it sucks oxygen out, goes to your extremities. So that's why people, it's random facts, but this is why you close your cross your arms we've evolved this way you've evolved to protect your vital organs it's not because you're bored or angry when you're tired or when you're not engaged you do this because it's you've evolved to protect your lungs your heart um, everything so there you go random fact for you but if you're not getting enough oxygen that's when you're sweating that's when you lose your thought process that's when you get red to the face take your time breathe practice with a friend it'll become more natural so you're not just sitting in a meeting going, hang on a sec I need to start breathing you know practice it Thanks, mate. Awesome. Anything else? One thing. You're so smart. No, I, I, I listened into your conversations. Really good conversations were had. And look, you'll learn more from this. Go away and practice it. Have a thought. Um, if you don't have any more questions now, because it is 8 o'clock and we are running out of time, Think about it when you go back to work. What I'm, what's one thing I'm going to do differently? Out of those 10 steps that I spoke about, even if you just do one, if you just practice being present, if you practice listening, if you practice not pontificating, it's a great word, isn't it? It's a pompous word, but practice one thing and it will make your conversations easier. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to me rant on for a while. If you want to contact me, you can get me at Twitter at FiggyFig. My email address is there. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm happy to engage and to, and to role play some more. It is a big subject. It's a massive subject. I'm always learning. If you have to go online and look at any leaders, watch and read things by Simon Sinek. Go and read the book Start, Start With Why. Go and watch all of his TED Talks. They're amazing. And it's all about putting the other person first. Thank you.